Let me uh, uh, present uh, Mr. Zahid Hussein. He is the manager of the ICNA <coughs> Relief here in Dallas at this location. And he's hosting us and allowing us to see the backstage of the, um, this operation. So thank you very much. You're most welcome. Is, yeah, is this yeah, mic working? Good? Okay. Hi there. I am Zahid Hussain. I'm from India. I came here to this country 20 years back uh, with my IT background and uh, worked for major corporations like Qualcomm, uh, Nortel Networks, Sprint Nextel, Warner Brothers, uh, to quote few. And then I thought, enough is enough. Let me focus on helping people. I used to volunteer for ICNA Relief. Let me give you a brief background about ICNA Relief. ICNA Relief started in the United States in 1978 by six brothers, two from Bangladesh, two from Pakistan, and two from India. They wanted to give back to the community because this country has given them a lot. So it started small in Jamaica, New York, and then it started spreading. And currently, we have about 27 field offices in, in different states. And we have about 105 employees just in relief alone working under different programs. The main programs that we have is number one, refugee facilitation. Number two, hunger prevention. Number three, disaster relief. And number four, is education and empowerment. Under relief, all these programs are there. And here in Dallas, uh, I joined as an employee in 2008. I started working with Hurricane Ike victims in Galveston and in Conroe City. I saw a totally different picture of United States. I saw broken down homes. I saw people shedding tears, nobody to take care. The, the whole house is gone, and FEMA hands them just $500. Imagine the pain. And one of the incidents which I cannot forget, which really made me shift my career to this, is we visited a house, and the husband and wife are of 80 years old. And just casually, I asked the husband, sir, do you have enough food in your house? He did not answer. He did not say anything. Again, I repeated the question. He just bowed his head down and didn't say anything. The wife caught his hand and said, it's OK, honey, tell them. They are here to help you. They are here to help you. Again, he did not answer. She said, it's been a week since I had a decent meal. We immediately rushed to the local food pantry and to the Ikna food pantry, which is there in Houston. We brought them enough food. We got them engaged to the local food pantry and informed them that there is not going to be, they, they don't have mobility. Give me one minute. Guys, zip it up. Sorry for that. So that really made, I mean, changed my heart. Like, this is the most powerful country of the world, and we have people suffering here. Then I started working with ICNA Relief a lot. And ICNA Relief has provided me a very good platform. And first and foremost thing that I did was open this food pantry under hunger, hunger prevention program. And I chose this place because this place is surrounded by about 750 refugee families of different countries. I'll show you the map when we come out of this, once the session is finished. We have about 27 different countries from where refugees are living here. You name it, they are here. From Africa, from Asia, from uh, South America, everywhere they are here. And it's just a walkable distance for them. And through this food pantry, we started building relationship with the resettlement agencies. We started working with Catholic charities. We started working with International Rescue Committee, Refugee Services of Texas, World Relief, both here in Dallas and in Fort Worth. We invited the directors here on Sunday. Sunday is the very busy day here, where we distribute food. They saw, they really got zapped. 
said, such a wonderful work has been happening. And they started sending their clients here. Like Friday evening, a family will land from some part of the world to the United States to Dallas. And the caseworker will hand them the address and the booklet and all the information about the food pantry. And they will be here Sunday morning with all their I-94s and apartment lease papers to register them and to get food. And the food that we gave is not sugary coated snack items or not high sugar juices or sodas. The food that you eat, the food that I eat, the food which Mike eats, that's what we give here. We give pasta, chicken, beef, mutton, rice, flour, uh, oil, diapers, sanitary pads, adult diapers, and all these items, it took a while for us to understand the needs. We didn't know what people from Bhutan is going to want. We don't know what people from Pakistan wants. We don't know what people from Chechnya wanted. So we studied it, we did a small survey, and then we finalized the list. And that's what has been distributed from past five years. So we started understanding the needs of the refugees, immediate needs of the refugees. And we came to know that when a family arrives newly, from the federal grant, they receive $980. Every individual, be it a baby or an old man of 102 years, they all receive $980 from the federal grant. And unfortunately, that money is not given to them by the resettlement agencies. What happens is that get recompensated by the furniture and the in-kind donation that they bring, in-kind items, like furniture, rugs, carpets, beds, mattresses, box springs, uh, food items. And at least 40 to 45 percent of that money is taken away by the resettlement agencies. When we started getting to know about that, we sat down, me, Sister Hala Halabi, my uh, co-worker, and we devised a plan. We said, we will run campaigns in our community and bring in good furniture and let, request the resettlement agencies not to touch this money. And we, pro, uh, we placed this memorandum of understanding before them. Not all the agencies agreed to that. Uh, we have International Rescue Committee and we have Refugee Services of Texas agreeing to this. And so what happens is, even before, say, Brother Ahmed from Syria is about to land here, a week before, their apartment is kind of fixed. And we get the keys from the resettlement agency. And we see to it that from carpet, all the household items, from the doormat, food, toiletries, number of beds based on the individuals that are going to come and live in that house, everything is taken care of by us. And as per the memorandum of understanding, as per the agreement, the resettlement agencies gives them the whole chunk of money to them. And we request these people to go buy a car because mobility is very important here. Back in, back in India, we have a lot of transport, very good transport systems. A lot of buses are flying in, a lot of trains are going. But unfortunately, here in Dallas, that's not the case, right? You have to have a car. So with that money, we request them to go purchase a car. So it's a kind of win-win solution. Even though the, uh, the resettlement agency or the arriving refugee family, they are not doing anything on their behalf, we are struggling. We are picking furniture from Mike's house. We are picking furniture from um, Brother Mustafa's house and then giving it to them. And there are standard sets. It's not that any, any furniture can go in. They have certain standard, high, high norm standard set, and we abide by that. And from past three years, this arrangement is working fine. So I want to stop here and ask you, if you have any questions, please ask me. Yeah. First of all, the, the, one of the main goals of this would be to uncover what's the obstacles or unique challenges that refugees have in success here. So if you know your topics, you better start asking now. Yes. Um, I mentioned a lot of hunger prevention stuff like that. What about illnesses and sicknesses? So if someone gets sick, where, where do they go? Could well, they the resettlement agencies who receive grant from the federal government it's their responsibility to take care of the health issues. So let me, talk, let me speak from their perspective. So I'm the resettlement agency, I'm the caseworker working for, let's say, IRC. So it's IRC's job is to pick the family from the airport, bring it to, the, to their apartments, and very next day, take them to the social services office, 
get them uh, social security number, have it registered, then take them to the uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and shots, all those are being taken care by them. And if the family has children, it's their responsibility to take the children to their school and have them enrolled. And whatever criteria is there that needs to get fulfilled, they, they do their best. And of course, if any family is suffering from uh, some kind of disease, like cancer or some kind of issues, mental health, it's their responsibility and they do take care of it. And some, let me talk about some of the challenges that these families face. Uh, we all are aware, right, right now it's Rohingya, prior to that it was Syria, and then before that it was Iraq, Afghanistan, and then Burma, different parts, right, different issues, Chechnya, uh, Bosnia, we, we were receiving families. So based on my interaction from past eight years with the refugees, this is what I have felt. Afghanistan, most of the people work with United States Army. They come here with special immigrant visa. Special immigrant visa, you work for them for nearly three years, and then you are bound to go to United States with your wife and children, land here, and then settle down here. And one good thing about that kind of visa is, within a week, you get your green card. It took me eight years, and my, for, for, for my family, it took about 14 years to get their green card. But for these people, since they worked, they collaborated with United States Army, they are special people, so they get their green card within one week itself. And since they interacted with the US Army, their English communication skill is excellent. If I hear that brother on the phone, it doesn't sound like he is from Afghanistan. It sounds something, somebody from Nebraska or somebody from San Diego talking to me. That good their communication skills is. Since their communication skills are good, even though they have, they have just passed their 10th grade or 12th grade there, they end up getting good jobs. Most of them end up working in security. Now let me talk about people from Syria. People from Syria, very few of them um, know English. Most of them, they do their dealings in Arabic. They are well versed in Arabic. So that language barrier is still there, especially with the adults, male members and female members. Female members are more inside their homes, so they don't get that English language exposure. But the children who come here, who go to start going to school, they pick up quick. They watch all the TV programs, and they pick up English communication skills well. So this is a kind of hurdle for the adults in Syria and also other parts of the United States, Iraq, from uh, Rohingya, from Burma. They, they don't have this, uh, they have this communication skill issue. Hence what happens is most of the people, they end up working in factories, warehouses, meat, meat factories, any labor work that they can do, they end up doing that. Very few of them come out and then do their studies, uh, go to college, and then they, it takes a while for them, at least two to three years. And some of the families are like, they were depressed throughout their lives. For, for example, Rohingyas. Rohingyas lived in Burma, Myanmar, and they were depressed. They cannot cross the city. They cannot cross the road. They cannot go from one area to the another area. Brother Mustafa may talk in details about that. And they cannot, if they are caught, they are put in jail. They cannot go to schools. So when they risked their life, when they came to Malaysia or when they went to Thailand, even there, they are bound to the place where the refugees are made to stay. They cannot go out, they cannot work, their children cannot go to school. So again, they are kind of depressed. So when they come here and they end up working in some like a Tyson meat factory or some warehouse, they end up, they start getting like $10, $11, $12. And most of them are cozily settled down with that $10, $12, $13, living in a single apartment and having three to four babies. And then they don't bother, they don't have that vision at all to, to come out of this cocoon to educate themselves, to educate well their children and make more money. So first thing, I, whenever I discuss with them this, I ask them, how much do you make per hour? Somebody says $10, somebody says $12. To the max, I, what I heard is $13. So if I tell them, how about you getting $25 per hour? They immediately agree, yeah, 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 we can do that. Then you have to educate yourself. You have to study, you have to learn English because you are in America. You have to learn mandatorily, you have to learn English. If I'm in India, I need to know Hindi. If I'm in Syria, I need to know Arabic. If I'm in Myanmar, I need to know Burmese. 
If I'm in Malaysia, I need to know Malay. You are in United States, and there are wonderful opportunities around. So that's one of the challenges that they face. Some people struggle like and come up, like Brother Mustafa. There are most of them, 90% of the Rohingyas, they don't care. They are getting enough money, they have a car, they have a wife, they have children. Nobody is knocking on their doors nine, night 2 a.m. to do the check. They are cozily settled down. Maybe their next generation, their children may end up becoming doctors or engineers. Okay. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you know, recognize Mustafa. Let's give Mustafa a hand. Well, we'll hear from him a little later. I wanted to, uh, brothers, I had to uh, maybe run down a list of the top obstacles to assimilation here, to success. What are some of the, you already mentioned some, what are some other obstacles they face here? Education is number one. If they educate themselves, then their mindset will open. The vision, the long-term goals will come into their picture. Right now, they know nothing. Even if I try to sit with them and chart, chart out a plan for next five years, they won't understand. So basic education is lacking. So if the focus, from the scratch, if you start focusing on education, that would be of great help. And, and secondly, uh, they need to move around the system. Most of them don't know how to do that. Most of them are stuck with the caseworker, and each and every caseworker, believe me, has about 70 to 80 clients to help. His focus is mostly on the newly, arrival, newly arriving refugees. So people who are there here for two years, three years, four years, who wants to renew their EAD, who wants to uh, renew, apply for green card, who wants to apply for citizenship, the caseworker does not have time. And there isn't any much programs here that can uh, focus on these kind of needs. So that needs to come into picture. That needs to come into picture. What's the next, like, uh, three, four, five? Uh, and for children, what happens with the children is, I'm seeing a big, huge, even I attended one of the meetings in, uh, in the Dallas ISD. We were informed, like, once the child, boy especially, goes to 10th or 11th grade, he drops off from the school. He stops his education and ends up working with his dad, ends up working with his uncle, or if there is no father in the house, the whole responsibility falls on him because the mother is illiterate, she cannot go out and work. So based on that, he stops his education totally and he ends up earning money. Once he starts ending, earning money, he is more responsible and he has a lot of freedom, he has a lot of respect, and he ends up getting married. I have seen 17-year-old kid getting married. And then immediately baby responsibilities, more responsibilities, and the buck stops there. So if they have enough education, then they can focus more on their future, think more before taking any drastic step, any life-changing step, and then they can progress well. In this aspect, I have noticed people from Bhutan and Nepal. They are very focused. You would see a Rohingya Burmese brother earning $11, driving a Cadillac SUV, which is not needed at all. And you would see a Bhutanese guy earning same money. He would be driving a Honda Accord second hand. He might have purchased with his tax return money for $4,000. And he has his limits known. He never steps out of his limit. And he, even though he will be working with his wife in some, in some provision shop, in some, in some Indian grocery shop, he would see to it that his children goes to college. And most of the girls ends up becoming nurses. And I've seen families within five years, they have moved from this place to Fort Worth, to Keller, purchasing a house. That's progress, that's the American dream, right? But com compared to other people like Somalis and Rohingya, Burmese, Syrians, Syrians are pretty new here. But Rohingyas, whoever are here, they are still stuck. Burmese who are here, here, they are so, still stuck. So can that be taught, those kind of skills? Absolutely. That's the reason why we, have, we are about to start, probably next Saturday, we are going to start computer classes here. We have already 45 students, individuals who have registered. They are working in warehouses. They are working as a massage therapist. They are working in, in some menial work, like housekeeping work in some hotels. 
So they want to change their career, and we are providing an opportunity here. Um, Saturday from 10 to 2 p.m., two sessions will be held, and we are going to, we have classified them into three different categories, basic Microsoft products, and then advanced level courses would be like Adobe Photoshop, video editing, and we want to introduce quality assurance as well, software testing. Software testing is on the boom. And I've seen Indian housewives taking up those jobs and doing well. Like per hour, they are getting 28 to $30. Yes? Uh, what, what kind of educational services do y'all offer here already? I know you spoke about computer classes, but to get people accommodated into the lifestyle progress. Uh, number one is uh, this. We just started this because Trump has canceled, like cut short lot and lot like it's it's not even half. Uh, this year, 2018, only 40, 45,000 individuals can land here, and 45,000 is nothing. Uh, previously, it used to be 135,000. It's now 45,000. Since the number of refugees would be coming to United States is very less, we wanted to focus more on those who are here, and that's why we started these education programs, and ESL program we are conducting here. Uh, for we have an Arab sister, she is well versed in English, and she is taking those classes for the refugees, for the Syri focusing more on Syrians, and for the Rohingya sisters. Uh, if I tell them like come learn ESL, attend ESL classes, learn English, they are not going to come. So I did a small survey and find out that they love sewing. So I spread the word like we are going to teach sewing classes here. So immediately, 25 sisters showed interest. And we ran a drive, and in, in my room, I have about 18 sewing machines ready to be used. And hopefully, end of this month, we are going to start sewing classes plus ESL. But that was kind of a way to get them into English. Into English, English, yes, yes. Just to lure them out of their homes. So these are all just tiny steps we are taking. Hopefully, more professionals will join this bandwagon, and inshallah, but God willing, we can do more. Thank you. Okay, more topics. So when the younger kids get here, the first thing, as far as education, is y'all want to try to teach them English. Is that y'all's first goal? Because I know you said the parents don't roll them in school. But do they get ESL programs at school? Yeah. Yes, of course. Because there are uh, children from, talk about, I'm talking about Rohingya community, they have never gone to school. And Syrians, from past four years, there is no school for them. So here, when they arrive, they have difficulties in understanding English. But they are picking up fast. So we need just that small, gentle shove so that they can learn more and pick up quickly. When families come to the food pantry to register, it is the kids who speak. They are the mediators. They are the one who ask questions to the parents and then pass on that information to us. Yes? What about um, the ESL classes? I know the women tend to like to stay in the home, but what about the men? Do you, are those offered? For men, uh, there, is, there is one happening in uh, Richardson Mosque uh, for Syrian men, a different class on during weekdays, whenever they, are, they, are, they don't have job, they come and attend. But again, it's all tiny bit, small step that we have taken. We need to do more. Yes? Are there like churches or temples or um, like anything around here to like accommodate religious? Yeah, like, there, Catholic like charities used to do this, uh, ESL classes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you're asking the religious needs of yeah. the refugees. Yes, uh, since we are Muslims and we are focusing more on Islam, um, we have a small uh, prayer place uh, made here within this complex so that uh, the people who are Muslims, they go and they pray five times a day, and that has been taken care. And for churches, I think so, the resettlement agencies is taking them, um, hooking up them with First United Methodist Church of this area, and they are taking care. And I see uh, Burmese uh, Christian churches also taking care of the Burmese. So something is happening on that aspect. So there's also like Yes, yes, they are providing the transportation, yes, yeah. Yes? Did you say transportation was a major problem here, mostly? Uh, no. It's not, everyone has a car, or? No, 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 yeah, you're right. So, understanding their needs, we came to know that uh, they do need cars, right? right. 
So that's the reason why we have this banner standing up here. Uh, what started in 2012 as just one car getting uh, facilitated, this year alone we gave about 38 cars. And believe me, three Lexus SUVs were given one BMW 5 Series were given. Was uh, 5 Series car was given in a very good condition. And because of the transportation uh, situation, uh, with that, is that why there's a uh, trying to word this right? Is there is mostly everything required, as in like going to the grocery store or going to a, an educational facility? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, without the car, you are stuck here, right? Like, if I don't have a car, I have to depend on Mike. And how many times will Brother Mike will help me? Right. He has his own life to take care, right? So that dependability is there. there. There are meat factories in Sherman, like Tyson Meat Factory is there. So I have seen people carpooling, paying $20 who don't have cars. For a week, they pay $20, $25. And then the guy takes, he also works there. And if some mishap happens, happens like, like timing changes, right? So the guy who drives the car goes from 2 p.m. to 1 a.m. And this, the other person's timing changes, then he's stuck. He cannot go. So that's the reason why we focus more on cars, car donations. What about yes. the uh, public transportation? Do people use that? Dart? Dart they use, yeah. But again, Dart has limitations, right? They have to take buses after buses after buses to reach their venue. Yes, sister. No, that was my question. Oh, OK. And then wait for 20 minutes, and then again that bus comes. And if he misses one of the buses, then it's gone. Whole day is gone. Yes? Um, so the resettlement agency, is there one agency that's taking care of all these people? There are right now four, four resettlement agencies. Okay. Catholic Charities, International Rescue Committee, World Relief, Refugee Services of Texas. Yes, ma'am. So when we got here, there were the, like kids here. They, they, were they being tutored? Yes. Okay. Every Saturday from 12 till 2, we tutor them. We, help, we do homework help. And any kind of complex situation they, that, that they cannot understand, like something in calculus, something in algebra, we help them. So most of the mothers here don't work, so there is no need for child care or anything? There is no need for what? Child care. Daycare. Daycare. There would be a need if the sisters start attending classes. There would be a need, yes. Are there people that take care of kids here? Right now, neighbors are taking care of neighbors' children. It's more of an informal, it's a, personal Yeah, informal, contact, yes. So. Yeah, personal contact, yes. Nothing official. Well, it raises the question of uh, what I've heard what helps refugees is talking to other Native Americans to find out how to do things. Are there any initiatives to help them with social capital or learning how to do daily things? It's all kind of self-learning. Um, like I have a brother here, Umar. He's a Rohingya brother. Mashallah, very smart brother. Very quick to pick up things. And he has been here helping me from past three years. Every Sunday he's here to help me pack food items and then deliver it and all that. So like this brother, whatever practical knowledge one can acquire, working with Americans, working with other uh, uh, people who are living here, they pick up quick, they, they try to friend them, and then they try to pick up the language, pick up the ways, ask questions. And that, that's the only way that right now they have. Based on, if, if someone wants to be reclusive, then, then he's at loss. That's how right now is happening. Uh, or, or, or else, like I did something wrong and I started explaining to others, like, hey, this is not the way. If the signal is red, don't go, stop. So whatever lessons learned, that is being shared among, across the community. Mm -hmm. Are people aware, are refugees aware of that, that the more they get out, the more success they will have? All the male members do that, but mm -hmm. not the sisters, right? Mm -hmm. They need to come out, they need to understand, they need to start driving, they need to take care of the children, they need to go to school, talk to the teacher, talk to the principal. What happens is if a, if a phone comes from the school saying that, hey, your child is sick, come and pick, the, pick, pick your child, the mother knocks on doors after doors after doors to understand what this person is saying. This is just one simple example. I mean, there are a lot of issues that they have without learning English. A lot of challenges are there. Thank you.
questions? Faith, do you have anything? Yes. Would you say that everyone here in the community uh, knows each other? Like it's more uh, close, people who get close? Or? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, these people were kind of, they came from those villages, right? So Mongdo is one of the main village, for example. So if, if Brother Umar is from Mongdo, I'm from Mongdo, I tend to interact much with them. So I tend to exchange information. My wife would go to his house and his wife will come to my house. That closeness is already there. That is there, but not with the outside world. So what we did is, uh, we uh, interacted with the Islamic centers and then we introduced a program called Mentoring a Family. Like Ahmed is an IT guy, he's earning 100K. He, his wife and his children would come to Brother Omar's house and take them out, make them understand, bring them to their house, prepare their kind of dish or make them prepare, bring one dish, make a, have a one dish party. That kind of an exchange is happening, but not on a major scale. That kind of raises the issue, are there any ethnic conflicts here around here? Yes, I did notice some of them between Burmese and Rohingya, but not on, not on a big scale. Like that, that kind of, uh, that, that, that seed is there. That seed is there. But in Afghan, between people speaking Pashto, between people speaking Dari. So when we go to a person who's speaking Pashto, deliver stuff, he said, no, 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 don't go there. <laughs> yes? Uh, in terms of payment, how do you think like, news and media portrays refugees? News and media, they're not doing a good job, right? We, everybody knows here. I don't have to say that. First of all, uh, we, uh, we started working with IRC, and uh, Sister Hala, my, my coworker, started participating in those uh, political activism and we've met several uh, councilmen, several uh, uh, politicians. None of them know what is happening. They are totally devoid, it's all black. We had to educate them. A plus, A for apple, B for boy, C for girl. I mean, cat. So they don't know anything. We have to educate them and whatever they see in the media, that's what they believe. Even common man, they don't know. Yes? Do they have problems being recorded? Because I was walking with this camera, and one man was like, why are you taking a picture of my house? Why are you taking a picture of my house? I'm like. Hey, yeah, they have. They re you need, we need to respect their privacy, right? Uh, so they have a problem with it or something? No, no, no. There isn't any problem. But prayer information, prayer, if you let them know, then that, that's something different. Like, I would not want you to come with the camera in my house. <laughs> yes. So the social workers that they are getting assigned to, are they part of the rehoming agencies or are they separate entities? Uh, I didn't get your question. So the social workers, you said that they take care of? The caseworker. Caseworkers. Are they yes. part of the rehoming agencies? Or Res uh, yeah, the resettlement agencies. Resettling yeah, yeah, they are the employees of resettlement agencies. So if they were to have like a dental issue or something like that, they could go to their caseworker case worker and they yes. could help them take care of yes. it? Okay. Yes. Is there like a high crime rate, like domestic violence or theft or anything? Like there, the there are violence. there are uh, incidents that had happened here, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, night two a.m. Somebody would come and break all the glass panes of the door uh, of the of their cars. Um, uh, people coming back from their night shifts. Uh, we have heard stories like they were abducted and the, their credit card, their check card. It happened, especially with the Bhutanese. It happened. That's why most of the Bhutanese are moving out of this place. Is it like mostly stranger on stranger like violence or they yes. all know each other? No, no, stranger on stranger violence. So are you saying they experience like hate crimes? I won't say hate crimes. Um, it's regular robbery. Okay. Yes. I heard you said that you usually check the, like they check the apartments and not why do you guys check the apartments? Uh, check the, the apartment for what? Like just go around and see who is in the apartment or I think I heard something like that. Well, also, well, there is a, uh, 
uh, an issue with the, one of the apartments here. I guess it's been condemned or something. Uh, I don't know if you know about it. And the residents had to move out pretty quickly. Uh, so that raises up uh, an issue. Uh, what, are, what, are the, what are the living conditions like here? Are the apartments nice or are they they're no, they are not nice. These are all low-income group apartments and you cannot expect much here. Every apartment is invest infested with bed bugs, cockroaches, rats. Um, it's there, flies. All, all, all those uh, parameters, all, all those things are there here. And uh, they are made to live here for a while. And most of the people, they end up moving towards Richardson because there it's little decent. Once they start making money, and um, they move out from this place. Okay. But most of them, some of them, they end up living here. So. Are you sure there's like a time period that certain refugees will stay before they move out, like you said, once they gain their yes. resources? Yes, what happens is, even before the family arrive, as I mentioned, let's say Ahmed's family from Syria is landing here. So they have to sign a six months lease minimum. Okay. So they end up living here for six months, and six months, they kind of settle down, the husband starts getting money, he starts working, right? So naturally they don't like the place and they move out. And I've seen doctors, engineers from Iraq, from different other places coming and settling down here and then moving to Irving. That place is much better than here. Yes? Are there multiple families in one unit or like just one family? No, there are limitations. Uh, one family in one apartment. And there is a family, uh, Brother Jasim, he has 12 children. And they were given three bedroom apartments facing each other. So half of the family lives there, half of the family lives here. Uh, speaking of, um, of children, how many um, kids do the families here typically have? Typically? Yeah, yeah, if you, if you had a range. For Somalis, the culture is, if you have six children, you are looked down. I mean, what, just six children? Oh, just, just six oh. children. Oh, you, you expect it to have more kids. Yes, the more, th that's their culture. Uh, whereas for Rohingyas, for Syrians, and for Iraqis, and other places, Afghanistan, uh, it's just two, three, two, three, very rarely we get eight children. We just had one Syrian family registered today with eight children, but that's very rare. But Somalis, they have a lot of children. Okay, okay. Do you have um, a lot of uh, um, pregnant ladies trying to come over, and how would how would the the conditions be for them if they're you know pregnant during the transport um, transition process? They are being well taken here because the caseworker immediately registers them to the respective hospital to which they belong to, and. Uh, whatever care that was not being done back in their countries, it starts immediately here, right? You have to attend those, take those appointments. Every month you need to go check and everything. Here it's much better. Okay, okay. Um, what if they needed like medication? Uh, do they go to the caseworker to get help with that? Is there any help from the government? For There's no help from the government, uh, apart from paying rent for four months. It used to be one year. It got slashed down to four months now. and. Uh, uh, utilities for four months and uh, any other kind of help like colleges, schools, uh, they do help. And uh, for EAD renewal, they do it. For green card, after, s after uh, one year, refugees are entitled for applying for green card. And for that, re resettlement agencies charge some money, like 400, 500? Some, some $500 per, per case. Uh, per application, and then they they have their own lawyers and they help them. And apart from that, for citizenship, yes, they do help. They have citizenship classes happening in libraries and in resettlement agencies as well. So anybody who knows English, they can attend and then do, they end up. Do they get health insurance, Obamacare? Um, is, is they, uh, they have health insurance, yeah. not Obamacare. They have the regular health insurance. Me Medicare, Medicaid. Okay. Medicaid. They have that, yes. Mm -hmm. They get food stamps. Every individual gets $150 food stamps. Okay, okay. Um, do they, do uh, the refugees family typically come as, as an entire family or is it just like the mom and kids and the husband come later? It varies or? case by case. I have seen uh, mom and kids arriving first and then the husband 
Um, there are cases where the the family is left back. In some in some cases in Rohingya, they could not able to cross take that treacherous journey that these male members have taken. They can and they are left behind. So this guy comes here, starts working, and then sends money to them. Unless they are brave enough to take that boat journey from uh, Cox Bazar to Thailand or Cox Bazar to Malaysia, and then have the UNHCR process them more quicker because the husband is already here. I have heard about those those kind of cases. Yes. What about depression? Do they face depression? Yes, uh, of course. When atrocities like what is happening in Myanmar, and your mom is there, your like his sister. He'll 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 narrate his part of story. Yeah, we all have seen yeah. the Naturally, video. Yeah. they do undergo depression. Do you think they take it until suicide? I haven't heard anything of that sort. Okay. Yes, they, they are frustrated, they are angry. Mm -hmm. So I know you said that they have medical insurance through Medicaid. Do they get dental insurance as yes. well? Yes, everything is being taken care of. So if they have to go to see a dentist, do, do you all have one that comes here, like a mobile dental unit, no. or they have to go find They have a to go, they have to go. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you said every, every individual gets $150 food stamps. Is that per family or every individual in that family? Every individual in that family. And it cuts shots once he starts working. Yes. How are living conditions for those family members who have like a lot of children? Like, are they crammed in like a one bedroom, two bedroom apartment, or how does that work? Uh, resettlement agencies do their best to accommodate in live, if the family is large in three bedroom. Like I mentioned, Brother Jasim's family has 12 children, right? So they did their best and they found out an apartment which has three bedroom facing each other and then they, they placed it there. So they do their best but sometimes apartments are not available, right? So you have to. And do they supply enough beds for them? Yes, yes. Those kind of things we, we ourselves are taking care, right? So. Yes. Um, you said some apartments have issues with like roaches or rats. Do y'all try to get some like uh, people out here to take care of that sometimes or do y'all not do that at all? We cannot do that because this, the whole place itself is infested. The best thing would be to torch it, bring it down and then rebuild again. Yes. Uh, as far as employment goes, if you say that uh, someone coming here would try to seek after uh, Field that they worked in prior, or would they try and find something new? So I've seen. Carpenter, would they try yes. and do that? Yes, I've seen ERPs. They stick to their field. Like a motor mechanic would try to find a job with uh, another automobile shop, and uh, electrician, handyman, they are doing very good, very good job here. Would you say once they broke past the language barrier, is it yes. relatively easy for them to find a absolutely. job? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. yes. Would you say the average family? stays here maybe like two or three years before they can kind of get all on their own? Uh, Country-wise, if you talk, Syrians don't live here. They immediately move out. And Iraqis also do the same. Um, Rohingya, Burmese, Bhutanese, Congolese, uh, Rwandans, they end up staying here. But does it matter on their previous social class? That yeah. might have an effect on that. Uh, I mean, but when they leave, what areas? They, typically they move to Irving, they move, they end up getting their Section 8 homes, so wherever they get, they move. Because normally on the Section 8, you might stay on that list for several yes. years. Is right. it the same? Yes, yeah, same, same place for them too, yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, when they can come here, everyone can hear her applying to asylum? They don't have to apply asylum. See, what happens is, the, the country in which they are born, like for example, let's take the example of Myanmar. So, Brother Ahmed is from Myanmar. He underwent all those atrocities. He saw his mother being raped. He, he saw his sister being raped. He saw his father being killed. So naturally, he would tend to leave that place, right? So he takes his brothers with him and then stealthily moves to Bangladesh. From Bangladesh, he pays some money to the smugglers who ply those boats, and then he lands either in Thailand or in Malaysia. So he, in Malaysia, he goes and registers himself in UNHCR camp with all those papers showing that he is a genuine case. And they have several sets of interviews, year after year after year. 
I have heard like there are families who were living in those refugee camps for 18 years, 18 years. And Syrians are lucky enough, they just stayed there for two years and they are, they are here. Uh, Afghanis, they don't have to live anywhere, they just land here. So after 18 years or after 10 years of time frame, they land here. So they land with EAD in their hands. So they are entitled to work from day one onwards. And they are legal here. They get their social security number, they get everything, driver's license, if they pass a driving test, and then they are like regular citizens. So what about grant like bills and all that? Like is that taken care of by What bills? Yeah, like you know, electricity and Yeah, for four months the federal government takes for care of them. Four Just for four months. Okay. It used to be one year, now it's slashed down to four months. Last quick one. I kind of want to move to. I want to give him a break too. So, um, I think last quick question. <coughs> uh, um, if someone passes away or some somebody uh -huh. has a tragic situation happen, family like, is there a proper funeral service uh, due to religious reasons, or if they just no, there is proper, there is proper uh, burial. burial. Yeah, what I'm talking from uh, Muslims' perspective. All the Islamic centers, they have a fund for burial. So any person who's not afford to bury their dead, like it's very costly over here, right? It's $4,500 if you want to bury in Denton. And if you want to do that same in Richland, it, you have to pay $7,000. So most of them end up in Denton. And all the masajids, all the masjids, Islamic centers, they have full of money sitting there. So based on their financial strength, some masjid pays $1,000, some masjid pays $200. And apart from that, the local community here, they pitch in money, 20, 30, 20, 30, 20. Especially with Bhutanese, they, they cremate. So for cremation, I believe it's 1,800 or $2,500. So every Bhutani family, when they know, they pitch in money, and then that's why it's taken care of. That's called maybe faith-based Yeah, faith-based aid. Uh, can we do a selfie? <laughs> Yes, it takes a while for them to understand. First year, they are very confused. They don't know what to do. Like, how oh, I was confused 20 years back. But then again, HNR block helped me. Now I have a doctor in the doctor. <laughs> Every week, we distribute about 1,500 eggs and um, about 150 gallons of milk. And the meat that we receive is from the halal stores, from the local Indian halal stores, kosher, equal to kosher. We request the donors to go place order there. And the local shopkeepers know how much to, to pack and what way to pack. So that way we go pick, up, pick it up and then have it stored here in these all stand up freezers. And there are some freezerless refrigerators also for eggs and milk. Let's come inside. Come here. As you see here, we have different we have different kinds of rice. We have basmati rice. We have basmati rice, and uh, we have parboiled rice. We have long grain rice. These parboiled rice is for those people who are suffering from diabetes. They request this, so we have we have to cater. They need it as well. And all the canned foods are here: cereal, pasta. A little bit of pasta is here, and uh, flour. Flour and sugar. All these are available in Walmart, Aldi's, and local Kroger uh, grocery stores. And here we have all different sizes of diapers because most of the families have children and they need diapers. So size one to size six, plus adult diapers as well. There are few people who have issues. Uh, so to deal with that, we have adult diapers and we have sanitary pads. We have families from Russia, from uh, Serbia, Bosnia. So this little tiny kingdom. Who goes on here? No one from Yemen. No one from Yemen. Same. So far, no one from Yemen. Yemen is totally locked, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even the agencies are not allowed to go. Sad state of affairs. So once a family arrives here, we do the intake and we register them. And then we provide them this kind of a car. And as you see here, there are about 177 single mothers who are seeking help from this food pantry on a regular basis. And the number of children, nine. Nine, 
number of children in the family, just the children, nine children. And the number of Rohingya families that we are supporting here is 262. 262 Rohingya families. Apart from this, we have all people from all these kind of countries, like we have people from El Salvador, Mexico. Our, us to our, his old apartment. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Yes. So I was just kind of looking around and I noticed that you'll have a lot of like soaps and conditioners. Do y'all provide them with toothbrushes or toothpaste? Cause I didn't see if you any. have, we give. If okay. you don't, we, we did have, but it got exhausted. Okay. So we run campaigns week after week after week, mm -hmm. focusing on different uh, regions, like different cities. We have a bunch of sisters from South Lake who are sponsors of doctors. Mm -hmm. They sponsor me. So every month they give about two thousand dollars worth of meat to us. Okay. Because her her major is uh, dental. Oh, okay. All right, let's go back out here. <laughs> okay, follow Mustafa. You guys can come and locate in there too. We have a two bedroom here. This is the, this is the apartment I used to live here. You but uh, the yeah, day before yesterday, they just called me and saying that, hey, you need to move to this apartment because there's some bands or something going on. This apartment, maybe they're going to break up. This is, they're going to make new. And I just moved there, the different apartment. <coughs> This is apartment me and my wife used to live here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they, they yeah. 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 Two weeks ago, we went to the New York. New York yes. And how was that? Good. Yeah, we own thousand dollar <laughs> from New York. I think a couple of weeks ago. So we just get a small apartment in the different complex. It says we just need to live there for temporary, but it's really very congested, small. So all the stuff we just take from here. When you guys come in, I talk with the mic, and then I know you guys are going to come today because I had an appointment with the mic. And then I just take in the stuff, all the stuff from here, and put in a new apartment. So this is how this refugee will live in here. So I, I uh, me and my wife and my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, so four. That's the hard part. The so they are old, they're getting old, you know? <laughs> they are old, so they used to live this apartment. Me and my wife live in the, all the way in the corner. And I have a one kids, the baby. We just get uh, six months old. So, and then we moved from here this morning to a different apartment, but still we don't have an electricity yet. I called them. They say the, this weekend is closed, so it's going to be come on Monday, which is tomorrow. So I requested the apartment. At least we have to be here because we need to cook the food. You know, there is no electricity. You can't go and cook there. That's why I just keep my laptop here. And because I'm working in the... Uh, translator over the phone interpreter. So I I've been working almost three years now. Um, the problem is if I move, I need to move and I need to disconnect my internet. So I can't, even before I need to, I disconnect my internet, I need to let them know the company where I work at least one week. I didn't know this, I have to move from here. So I request the apartment manager, I says, I can't disconnect the internet because I had to give them Notice at least one week before, but I already sent the email. I said, sorry for your inconvenience, so I have to move. But I don't know it's acceptable because they told me before I start this, before they hire me, they told me during the orientation. So I request the manager, I said, I have to keep this internet service until the technician arrives and install a new apartment. Yeah, so that's says, requires internet for his translation. Yeah, because I have a home phone, they call. I just 
log off. If I log in, you guys cannot have a time to talk to me. It's really busy. Right away, hang up one, again, hang up one, again, the whole day, whole night. It's very busy. So that's why I like this job. And I work in the different, I, told, I think I told you, I know the few of you guys know me before I met in the Collins College. So I think some of them, the rest stranger, they don't know me. So I work in the testing food company. I think have you ever heard? I work in the translate in there, uh, like paperwork. There are a lot of Burmese community people and Rohingya people who can speak English. And we have the health service over there. I think there are 1,700 team members are working in the production area. So I'm helping with the people there. So I started a couple of months ago, the testing company, I just, just translated there. So I start my work from here, 3 o'clock, from 3 to 12 a.m. in the morning. So from 8 o'clock to and 12 a.m., I'm working here. So two jobs. <laughs> you know, in America, it's difficult. If you have one job and you have to pay too many bills, it's not enough, you know. So I don't know whether you guys know. I used to live first. Uh, when I came in the United States, the first time I part of the country, New Hampshire. Uh, which is the new nature. I lived there one and a half year uh, as a caseworker in this agency. I think the refugees, the people they bring in from the different countries, an agency which is called Lutheran Social Service. So I know the background of the refugee, how they take care when the refugee coming from the different country. I know how they offer them, how many months they helping them. You know, so I know because I work one and a half years caseworker in New Hampshire as a refugee when they come in. Here, there are two programs. The one is says machine gram, the other one is say RCA. So machine gram means the one, you can say refugee temporary assistant. The one RCA, refugee cash assistant. So when you choose the program from one of those, if you choose the machine gram, they will only give you six months. They're going to provide you six month rent and Yes, yeah, six month rent and see for six month food stamp, which is Texas Ben I think they over here. You know the food stamp, right? So they provide the food stamp for six months and then rent for six months. So within the six months you have to find a job. Or there is a uh, the volunteer agency working there who can help in the people, refugee people and find a job. So what is their responsibility when the new family arriving from different country and then when I work there, my responsibility is when, I, when the family arrived there, and then I helping them, uh, explaining them what did what did the agency is going to be, how long agency is going to be take care of them. Like six months is depend. If you choose RCA, RCA is refugee case assistant. If you choose TNFA, which is refugee temporary assistant. Uh, if you choose that one, it, they take care for eight months. If you choose RCA, they take care for six months. So some people, they pe some people, you know, they choose in for different people have different idea of choosing, you know. So they choose in for whatever they want. So within six months, you have to find a job. You have to get a job. Not your responsible. The agency responsible to find a job for you. Then if you don't find a job within six months, what will happen? How are you going to pay the rent? It's, it's difficult, right? Then there is another two more months, the government helping you, the agency is going to help you. They give you two more months chance, and you need to find a job. If you don't find, what happened? Then there is another program, which is called uh, Refugee Temporary Needy Family Assistant. So they're going to help you. The same matter you have job or not, I don't know, I know about here when I came in here, but I didn't know when I was there. So if you don't have a job, should be the reason why you can't have a job. Or you can say language barrier, I cannot speak English, people they don't like me higher, or I am disability, I can't work. So they, you have to give the reason. So when you be approved there, they're going to take care of you as long as, you know, until you find a job. So once I move here in Texas, Totally different. Okay, let me present uh, Mr. Hisham. And uh, you met, some of you met Fadi. Remember Fadi? He was on the video I showed. This is uh, Fadi's dad. And uh, uh, can you explain, uh, did you 
Where did you come from and did you live here? السؤال اللي بسالك هي انه تحكي لهم من وين اجيت واذا عشت هون من ايجيبت؟ يا يا انا اجيت من ايجيبت من مصر هي كيم فروم ايجيبت فروم فروم ايجيبت بالمجمع هذا ايجيبت قبلها وين كنت؟ اه كنت بسوريا هيز ا سيريان هي سيريان هو ريفيوج تو ايجيبت اند يا هي ليفت اور فلو because of the war yeah like to save his kids and family he, he lived in C in Egypt for year years he worked and established himself over there Wow. And then, like he has a chance, he had a chance to immigrate here. He, at the time, he believed that the, this is a good chance for his kids. He was so happy when he got the chance to come here, but the first place. He saw the United States was this apartment <laughs> complex, okay? <laughs> For them, it was very hard. <laughs> they lived in a better places, you know, they are middle class people. Yes. What was life like yeah. before? He, he was a businessman, he has his own. And he's considered like to be rich in his hometown. He's not even like an average or a middle class, but from the upper middle class people in his town. Uh, the war took everything that he built through the years. The only thing that he remained with is his family and a little bit of his saving. And even in Egypt, he started to establish himself again there. And now he is trying to continue on the same path. طورنا من كنا قاعدين هون قعدنا مدة شهر بعدين طورنا من مكان لمكان فهيئ لنا عمل صرنا فرص وانا وزوجتي وبنتي كلياتنا ايد وحده ومتكاتفين وعم ننشئ حالنا هي with his family lived for one month here and then they moved where did when رحتوا؟ رحنا على المجمع زلينك 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 ان ريتشاردسون افضل من ذلك ان ريتشاردسون and now he his wife his daughter are working in order to re-establish themselves. They have now three bedrooms, a good place. Now, uh, before they were lived in just two bedrooms. And how many kids you have? Five. He has five kids, three girls, two boys, and him and his wife. Remember, Mr. Zahid said, he said that the people here, and he refers to them as friends, they help them a lot. They give him their furniture, they help him with a car. And after that, he worked and got another car move to a better place and they are doing good and he's thanking God for what he got right now. Uh, they came, this is, this is their ninth month so they have been here for nine months. His kids are doing good in learning the language. He's always learning English too. He has a class today. What about your wife? Uh, 
Okay, his wife is working uh, in designing clothes and she starts with a well-known designer in Dallas and by that she's picking up the language. Yeah, she liked to design clothes and she has some uh, experience, did it in Egypt and now she seems that she has found a chance and will do it again. His uh, older uh, daughter, she's 18 years old and she's working at Walmart after school. She has to repeat, actually she has to repeat classes in order because she doesn't have the language, yeah. And Fadi also, uh, he's giving him a hard time, but he's doing well at school as well. What? He's a friend? His girlfriend or boyfriend? <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, he's with his girlfriend outside. So notice, uh, remember Zahid talked about the uh, uh, Syrians might leave here quicker than maybe other ethnic groups. And also kind of notice the, the social class that they started in, you know, they'll drop when they get here, but, you know, where will they rise back up to? Maybe similar to where they came from. Um, what kind of jobs do you see refugees get when they first come here? <laughs> Okay, first of all, they start with Walmart. <laughs> and then after they know the area, what's going on, they start to uh, work as a delivery, to delivery, yeah? Uber. Uber. Amazon. Amazon. Thanks to Amazon. He, he's saying like Syrian or from uh, Syrian women so, so many people refugees are working for Amazon it's just like they're so now they know the country they know the country more than the natives <laughs> more than you guys <laughs> هل هو لأنه ما في حاجة لكتير لغة إنجليزية بهاي؟ آه ممكن هو هذا شيء بيلعب دور بس آه هو السهل ال ال yeah, yeah, and, and this is the, re the reason is that this kind of work, first of all, it doesn't need that much of the language to know the language, and the second, it is the best offers that they are getting right now. All right, specific questions for him? Questions? Any other, you know, Fadi's your, there. Your, your topic. Hey, Fadi, let's let's give a hand for Fadi. <laughs> yeah, so you know some of us, right? Already. <laughs> yeah. So, um, give me some more specific questions related to your topics. And we already heard from Fadi that, you know, he's a go-getter. He gets out and talks to the people, learns the language, finds out the culture, gets cultural capital to, uh, to make it here. To assimilate here. <laughs> question for you guys. If you see Fadi and his dad, let's say, in the street, in Walmart, or in a mall, will you be able to identify them as refugees? No. Mexican? <laughs> Mexican? Yeah. Do you think that Hisham look like Mexican? I, I feel in that more American than you guys. More like Italian. Italian. Okay. Fadi. Both. Both. Okay. Okay. European. Okay. But not 
like Arab, Muslims, tourists, <laughs> all this stuff? No, no, no. Okay. Um, uh, what what uh, things do you see that refugees need to do more of here to make it? سؤاله إنه شو باعتقادك إنه اللاجئين في أشياء لازم يعملوها أكثر حتى إنهم يندمجوا وتكون حياتهم أسهل. You mean like to have a, uh, like a simple or easier life. Yeah, what things to do, what things to learn, what things. آه أشياء يعملوا. هو أهم شيء يعني لي ليندمجوا بالموضوع يدخلوا بالبزنس بالشغل يعني يعملوا بزنس خاص فيهم هون بال. Entrepreneur. Yeah, his idea is that for the refugee, in order to be able to assimilate, to find their own business, like entrepreneur, so th this would help them to integrate in that. Let's say not at this age, assimilate as much, integrate, so they have more relations with the society around them. What else? Shukaman. <laughs> Okay, guys, like for them, like their plan is to have houses, to own houses. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's again like how to plan to get a loan and buy a house with this limited income because they are like paying 1500 a month. It is not cheap, you know, to pay for a rent that you will, it's not a savings, that, that there is no any kind of a future income from, from this. Yeah. So will business, who will be with it? Okay, so his idea that the business will bring the house, but <laughs> the house will not bring a business. So yeah. But when you make more money, that starts kicking you out of welfare benefits, right? Uh, Medicaid, food stamps. هلا بقول إنه لما بصير أنت دخلك أعلى فرح تخسر أشياء كثير رح تخسر المد التأمين الصحي. رح تخسر هو هم هو هذا مش هم يعني رح تخسر ال ال رح تخسر خلينا نقول المساعدات اللي عم بيجوك للاكل انا ما بحاجه لمساعدات اذا صرت امن انا حالي بحاجه هي سيد ذات اي دونت نيد ذيس از لونج از اي كان ورك اند هاف انكم ذات تو كفر ذيس ثينجز اتس نوت اتس نوت يا اي ويل ليف ات تو سم ون ايلس هو نيد ات لانه انا حاكسب اكثر من المساعدات اللي عم بحصلها يا باي هافينج هيز اون بزنس هي ويل جيت مور انكم more than even the aids or the helps that he's getting from the government. Okay, what kind of health problems do you see here? Have you seen, maybe you haven't been here long enough, but uh, do people get more sick here? I'm asking you, during your time here, what did you see the health problems here? Did you feel that people are more sick here? No, I didn't see that, but I mean, والعامل الجو هون بالمكان اللي نحن فيه هلا قاعدين فيه هلا في امراض يعني ما انه مكان في امانه ما انه صحيحه هي سيد ذات هي ديدنت نوتس ات ذا تايم فور لايك 1 مانث انا طلعت من هون مشان يا فور ذا 1 فور 1 مانث هي ديدنت نوتس اني انكريز اور ديزيزز هير بات ان جنرال هيز فيلينج ذات ذس بليس از كوندم يو نو جست لايك ذات اتس نوت هيلثي اتس يا not healthy for him and his family to escape. Yeah, maybe if Zahid comes, he can explain the, like the first case of Ebola w occurred in, in these apartments. But that wasn't from conditions no, here. You don't get Ebola from here. It's, it was because of it, maybe an immigrant. Uh, but you, know, you, will you will have maybe uh, those issues to, to think, can, about, yeah. think about. Uh, what other possible things we can, yeah? What about finding like, dental care? Was that hard to find a dentist? Or was that a priority? تسأل كيف كان بالنسبة إذا رح تشتوا لطبيب أسنان؟ هل كان صعب؟ or هل في أولوية إلكو؟ لا نحن بشكل عام طبيب أسنان عم مغطيين ميديكيت يعني للأطفال نحن الكبار لا ما نمغطينا 
فمروا على عيادات اسنان هون قريه نعرف الروح نعرف نتعامل معهم وعم نعمل اسعارهم لا هي على الميديكيت بس أوكي. بالنسبه للكبار ما عم هم للكبار اه Uh, they for the kids they are Medicare. already covered with Medicare, you know, so and they know where to go. And for the older, like he and his wife, they are not covered, but they have like kind of the clinics. They know clinics here, and they if they need anything will come and. Check there. When they came here, Medicaid didn't offer for adults, just children. لما اجيتوا هون ميديكير بس للاطفال انتم الكبار لا لا بخص الاسنان فقط لا او جست فور دنتال دي ديدنت كفر ذيم باقي باقي الامراض لا نو نو دي ار كفرد بات نوت فور دنتال هيلث اند دكتورز اوكي اني كويستشنز فور فادي اباوت اسيموليتنج اور سكول سكول ايشوز دو ار بيبل نايس تو يو ات سكول لايك دو يو هاف ا Like, do you have a lot of friends? Was it easy for you to make friends? Yeah. Yeah? American. Most of them American? Okay. <laughs> My question will be, does your sister, like, face any kind of discrimination because she's wearing hijab? I start to hear, like, some, yeah, some students in the school, they are bullied for their scarf. Actually, like, some, sometimes people ask her, but when she, when she answers, They be like, oh, that amazing, that awesome. So that's good. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, to lobby Rahibu Bikum. <laughs> you understand that? Okay. All right. Let's thank, thank them for. Mustafa, give us the instruction how to eat this. <laughs> <laughs>